Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this particular book we've been studying for so many months, and we thank you how the book ends with the most incredible revelation of the future, something that just staggers the imagination, but we know it's true, and you'll bring it in, and we just thank you for the glory that awaits us, and we know the only reason we'll be part of it is because of what Jesus did. Your Son, who is eternal God, who became flesh and bore our sins in His own body on that cross and then rose from the dead. Uh, we, we thank you for the celebration today of Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into that city on the donkey, about to offer His life not many days from then. And Lord, we just thank you that He did offer Himself, that you did send Him and that He did raise from the dead. And now we can, as believers in Jesus Christ who have trusted Him as Savior, we can look forward to the resurrection that He will bring in the future. So, Lord, encourage us today in these uh, verses we read today in, the, in a very discouraging world that seems to have no hope and no understanding of where everything's going. But, Lord, encourage us in Christ's name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's go to the first four verses that we've been focusing on and Revelation 21, 1 through 4. So again, John is given, the, given this revelation by God. It's Bible prophecy. We're not in the kingdom. We're not in the millennium. We're not in the new heavens and new earth. So this is what awaits the future. And John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth passed away. There is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he'll dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Isn't that great? That's going to all go away. And I bet this last week some people had pain and sorrow and sadness and maybe physical pain or uh, maybe something emotional, something happened. And uh, we just we go through this day after day and we realize one day when Jesus uh, comes back, he, uh, the Lord will take all of this away. Well, last time we uh, actually looked at verse 1, so let's move to verse 2. Verse 2 says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So verse 2 speaks of this holy city, and it tells you what the holy city is. It says it's the new Jerusalem uh, coming down from heaven. So why the reference to Jerusalem? So was there... There's a new Jerusalem, but was there an old one, obviously? And is Jerusalem important in God's plan? Would you say so? Good, you get an A plus today because if you read Scripture, it's very important. Uh, Satan will say, yes, it's a very important city that I want to destroy. I want to destroy the covenant people, and he has his perspective on it, and he knows how important it is, but God has his perspective, and He'll bring His promises to pass uh, related to uh, Jerusalem and all of this. So we're going to talk about Jerusalem this morning. And I remember when I was uh, in ICU, uh, recovering from the heart attack and then waiting the heart transplant, um, you have nurses assigned to you usually two days in a row, night nurses, day nurses. Sometimes there's two at a time. And uh, the one I had assigned me to me that day uh, I was watching a lot of the stuff on TV with Israel and all the fighting with Hamas. And she walked in, she's a Christian, and she said, you know, I've been looking at this, why are they doing that? 
why are the Jews so important? About, what's all this deal about the land and, and the holy city? And why does everybody want this piece of real estate? And why all this fighting? And uh, why is this so significant? What do you think I did? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. And I, so I took this opportunity to open up some scripture and show her how important this is. And of course, they don't have a lot of time to sit down for an hour and talk to you because <clears throat> they are busy. <clears throat> so some of them would come in throughout the day. Okay, I got one quick question. I got to go. So I told her, I gave her a few minutes on this, and she went, wow, okay, I didn't even know that. But when she came back in and a couple hours later, I saw her again, and uh, I had a chart pulled up on my laptop. And so let me show you the land and, and where this started and where it's going. And she's like, I never knew any of this. So a lot of Christians don't know their Bible. They're saved. They believed in Christ, thank God. <clears throat> but they aren't studying the Scriptures and do... Does the Bible appeal to every aspect of life? Uh, political theory, absolutely. Uh, government, the things we see on the news, uh, politics, all this stuff we're looking at, a lot of this you'll see right in Scripture, and, and all these answers are there. Uh, so I think we just need to open our Bibles more and look. But I didn't reprimand her, I just showed her, and I wanted her to have that perspective that this is very important. And you know how I've been over the, what, almost 20 years here, 18 or so, uh, we talk about the Old Testament, the covenant God made with Israel, and we've been looking at this over and over. Uh, so I thought I'd talk about this a little bit this morning in summary. So the Jewish people and Jerusalem, this holy city, is very important to God's purpose and plan. So just like many subjects in the Bible, you follow the bouncing ball. Like kingdom, it's, it starts, and where does kingdom begin? Where would you go? Thank you. Some people say Isaiah or uh, Matthew. No, Genesis 1, because God creates Adam and he's a king. He's to rule. And he loses that kingship because Satan tempted them and he, he committed sin. So now Satan's the ruler of this world. So is Satan a king? Yes, small k, and I'd also put evil in front of it. But he's a ruler, and Jesus called him that. The ruler of this world has been judged. So... All, there's so many subjects that go from cover to cover in the Bible, and Jerusalem um, has quite an extensive amount of revelation related to it. So we're going to follow. Is it, people are going, follow the bouncing ball. <laughs> Somebody from Africa came here and said, you said a, rubbing the rabbit's foot and how evil that is. And re Remember that? Anyone ever had a rabbit's foot and it was like a good luck charm and all that? I was rebuking that. But they had never heard that in their culture, so... Uh, remember the bouncing ball for music? Mark, maybe we need this when we do music, a little bouncing ball to keep the beat, right? Well, we're going to follow the bouncing ball about Jerusalem today. And as we do so in the Old and New Testament, you're going to see how important this city is as it leads to a new Jerusalem. So real quick, I'm going to give you, obviously, most of you know where it is. Um, but you, have, you see Africa down there in the bottom left where the Jews left what area before they got to the land? In the time of Moses, where were they? They were in Egypt. And so they were slaves, and they eventually went to the land that Abraham and Isaac and jo Jacob, they had sojourned there. So Israel is in the Middle East, and hopefully, I don't know how easy that is to see, but it's blown up there. And uh, I'll give you a bigger picture here. So there's modern-day Israel. So you have the land of Israel, and you've heard of uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the fighting that's going on in Gaza uh, so there's Egypt down there, again, at the, in the bottom left. So there's the land of Israel in the orange, and then Jerusalem is up there a little bit north, uh, northeast. And so um, where is Jerusalem? Right there, the holy city, also called Zion. Um, now, going back, now this is the slide I showed that nurse. I said this goes way back because when the Jews left Egypt, initially... Uh, they entered the promised land. Now, the entire boundaries of the promised land that God promised Israel extends all through that light blue area, including the dark blue. But when they initially got to uh, the land, they only possessed the dark blue area. So was there more to come? And so God keeps promising the boundaries. They go uh, across the Jordan under the time of Joshua. They start taking conquest of the land. But the Jews never fully occupied every inch of the 
of the borders without enemies in the land too. And we're still waiting for that. When Jesus rules, he'll remove all enemies and Israel will occupy every inch of that land. So when you get to the time of David and Solomon, uh, hopefully the color's distinguishable, but you see Jerusalem. David's kingdom was in the darker brownish area. Uh, but when Solomon ruled, his son, remember David rules 40 years and Solomon rules another 40 years from uh, uh, 971 to 931, uh, you see how his kingdom was expanded into the lighter areas. But look at that. I hope you can see it. But you see modern-day Israel mapped out. Can you see that? Uh, Julio, can you see that back there? Okay, if Julio can see it, we're good because he's on the back row. But do you see how small that, that region is? Where, where's the rest of that territory? Why don't they have it? Will they? Say yes. <laughs> God promised it. He's just going to do it in his time. And a lot of this has to do with Israel's obedience. Um, their disobedience costs them the land. They're constantly thrown out. But God never broke his covenant with them. Um, so he's working out a plan, and uh, Jerusalem is central to that. So Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, uh, the Hebrew name for the city. Now, this has a very rich history, Old and New Testament. Jerusalem shows up in the Bible over 800 times. Uh, that's a lot, so it's definitely very important. Uh, there's arguments over the, what the name of the city means, Yaru Shalem. Where do you think Shalem comes from? Shalem, Shalem, Shalom, peace, wholeness, uh, something like that, maybe completeness. So some say it means possession of peace. Some say foundation of peace. Some think the root is yara, which is to point out, so it means to point out the way of peace. Others say they will see wholeness and completeness. So I don't want to be too definitive on the meaning because if you even go to Jewish websites with these uh, people that speak Hebrew, they're not all in exact agreement. Um, whatever it is, it's going to be found, uh, just fantastic. Israel will possess the land under the time of Jesus. It will be uh, a land of peace and so forth. Uh, the theological word book of the Old Testament, it says, mentioned by name 669 times in the Old Testament alone, Jerusalem is the world's most significant city. Um, I don't know if any of you saw Pete Moore's presentation uh, when he did uh, the prophecy of Daniel 9 and so forth, but he showed on a grid, on a map, scientists have grid at the earth, Jeru the Jerusalem and Israel is right in the center of the earth. Uh, it's one of the most. It's the most major trade route uh, in the in the earth, and all. It's just amazing how how God put that right there in the center, you know. But anyway, that's another another discussion. So this uh, particular writer quotes Psalm forty eight one and two, which was what we talked about this morning in the opening scripture reading. Psalm one forty eight one and two: Great is Yahweh, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. And you'll see often Zion and Jerusalem put in parallel, meaning the, the same place. So in the time of Joshua, now I'm doing this in chronological order. So after the Jews go into the land, we know they wandered in the wilderness because of their sin for 40 years. Eventually they'll go into the land, but Moses won't take them in. And the first generation was punished, so the second generation goes in under Joshua. And in the time of Joshua, Jerusalem was inhabited by Jebusites. Uh, Joshua 15, 63, now as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites live with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day. So there's still others occupying the land. And then you get to the next book, the book of Judges, which is chronologically after Joshua. But you see in Judges 1.8, Jerusalem was captured by Judah. So Judges 1.8 says the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. However, verse 21, but the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. Uh, so the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem till this day. Well, when you get to the time of King David, roughly 1000 B.C., David will capture the city and make Zion the throne of God's presence. Notice the same location. 
So 2 Samuel 5, 6, and 7, when David is uh, told he'll be the shepherd of Israel, it says, the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, and they said to David, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will turn you away, thinking David cannot enter here. So they're mocking him. They're saying, you're not coming into this city to do anything, and the blind and the lame will even defeat you. No, 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 right? Um, but nevertheless, I like this, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. So the Lord made David a mighty warrior and gave him great victory in battle, and here's one location. So this location was God's chosen land for His chosen people. Uh, down below in the blue, you see Psalm 132, 13. For Yahweh has chosen Zion, He has de desired it for His habitation. So did God ever dwell in Zion? Well, remember when um, Solomon builds the temple. First uh, Kings, starting in chapter 5, all the way through chapter 7, he will build it. And then in First Kings 8, one of my favorite chapters in Scripture, because Solomon uses the Torah as he praises God, as he dedicates this incredible temple that has been built. He dedicates the temple all through chapter 8, and what he says in one verse, he says, I have surely built you, talking to the Lord, a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. Now, when we think of a house, we think of where we're going to go to go sleep tonight or just where we live. Where do you live? What's your address? And so forth. But in Hebrew, the Hebrew word bayat can refer to a home. It can refer to the king's palace. That's called a bayat, a house. But what else does it refer to? A dynasty, the Davidic house of David, the Davidic dynasty, but also refers to the temple. So the house of God is often the temple, and that's what Solomon just built, and he dedicated it to the Lord. But notice it isn't just some building that was beautiful. It was a place for God to dwell. And remember, uh, just like at the tabern in the tabernacle, God would come down and dwell in the Holy of Holies in that tent of meeting in the Old Testament when they're in the wilderness. Well, now they build a solid foundation, put a temple on it, and the Lord still comes down in the Holy of Holies and dwells there, which He did when they dedicated it. I tell you, one place you'd want to be, I think it'd be so neat to be alive the day on that day to worship with them and watch the dedication of the temple when God appeared and filled that house. That would have been amazing. But we just have to read about it. So even after the time of Solomon when the kingdom divided, because remember after his rule, the kingdom will split to the north and the south, southern kingdom of Judah, the capital of, has Jerusalem as its capital. The north is Samaria with a capital, or the northern kingdom of Israel has its capital of Samaria. So the kingdom divides. Jerusalem still the central place of worship. You can see this in 2 Kings 23.1. Then the king sent, that's King Josiah, and they gathered him, he gathered to himself all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. So this was always the central place of worship. Remember when um, Jeroboam went north at the split? What did he build up in the north? I mean, the place of worship is in the temple, right, in the south, in Jerusalem. But he puts two golden calves. <laughs> Remind you of anything? Well, he puts two golden calves in the north and uh, tells the people, you can worship there. Uh, it was this terrible situation, and the Lord really came down on him for that. So Israel is going to continue to sin in the north and also in the south. So God, because of Israel's sin in the north, He allows it for a time, and eventually the kings just keep perpetuating the sins of Jeroboam, and then God uses, remember the nation He used to punish Israel? The nicest nation that ever lived, Assyria, just torturous people, and they didn't just want to overtake you, they wanted to humiliate you and torture you before you died. And so he will use them to punish Israel in the north in 722 B.C., and then the south will last a little longer, but they eventually really go into sin deeply, and God will punish them with Babylon. So when you get to, um, we, we won't uh, read this in great detail, but when you look at 2 Kings 25, the chapter is devoted to God using Babylon to destroy Judah and destroy the temple and so forth. Um, so I'll read you a couple of verses, 2 Kings 25, 1, 
in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came, he and his army, against Jerusalem, camped against it, and built a siege wall around it. So when you want to siege a city, you, you, you box them in. Why would you do that? You starve them out. You can, they're not going to get any supplies or you don't have airplanes to come drop stuff in, right? Uh, so they're going to just <coughs> uh, starve them out, which the people did. It even said some of the people ate their own children to survive. Uh, you can read this in the text. We're almo- <coughs> Before I went into the hospital, we were in Second Kings. We were getting close to this, this text where um, after the kingdom divides and then the south would go out under Babylon. But I'm going to pick up again in verse 8. Now, in the seventh month of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent a servant, I'm sorry, a servant of the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the temple, the king's house. I think he he also destroyed Solomon's palace and all the houses of Jerusalem. Even, uh, Even every great house he burned with fire. So all the army of the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, which were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Then the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon and the rest of the people, and Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away into exile. What is the exile? The Babylonian captivity for 70 years. So... So you have the post-exilic community, the exilic community in Babylon, and I'm sorry, pre-exilic, then post-exilic is when they go back to the land, which is Ezra and Nehemiah. So when you study Scripture, uh, give me a a prophet of the exile. Daniel. Who else went into captivity? Ezekiel. Now, when they go back to the land... Uh, you have books, who, what are the books? Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Those are all dealing with the post-exilic community, and then God sends prophets to minister to them, Jewish prophets, Haggai, Malachi, Zechariah. So it's important to know what prophet is in what period of history. So Jerusalem is the central home of the returned exiles when they go back to the land. Now Ezra, he's going to focus on the rebuilding of the temple, and Nehemiah is going to focus on the rebuilding of the walls. Aren't walls evil? Weren't we told that? No. Right? We don't want borders in our country and all this. But, hey, God put, had walls around the city, which Babylon broke down, and then they go back to rebuild the walls for protection. So walls in and of themselves aren't evil. And some of the people that said that had gated communities around their house for protection. Anyway, am I getting political? But anyway, Ezra 1, um, it says, All the articles of gold and silver numbered uh, 5,400. Sheshbazar brought all of them up with the exiles who went from Babylon to Jerusalem. Uh, So they come home, and then Nehemiah 2. Now remember in Nehemiah 2, King Artaxerxes sees um, uh, Nehemiah looking all down in the mouth. He goes, what's wrong? He goes, well, I'm depressed because in my homeland it's destroyed. It's like people who, I mean, the temple was devastated. Solomon's temple was just put in ruins. It's like people who go back home after a tornado has wrecked their home. And they go back and see all the rubble and the ruin, and it's depressing. And so Nehemiah knows the city's destroyed, and he wants to go back, and the king lets him go. And uh, so what prophet ministers to them? Haggai. And Haggai, that book is devoted to the rebuilding of the temple and But he said, the one that's coming in the future will be more glorious than Solomon's. And who's going to rule in that one? Jesus Christ. So you got all this prophecy of encouragement as they're rebuilding. And we need encouragement in times like that. So Nehemiah 2.17, when Nehemiah gets back to the land, he tells the people, you see the bad situation we're in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burn with fire. Well, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we'll no longer be a reproach. So they're going to rebuild the temple and then uh, rebuild the walls around the city. So the Old Testament even predicts that Messiah, Jesus Christ, would rule in uh, Jerusalem or Zion. So if that's the prophecy, is God going to change locations? 
Ah, I just can't beat the devil. I think I'll just move it to, how, how about Switzerland? That's neutral. Or let's go to uh, Australia. No, he's going to keep it in the same place, and he can deal with the enemies no problem. So Psalm 2.6, as for me, God says, I have inst- this is God the Father, I have installed my king, Jesus, upon Zion, Jerusalem, my holy mountain. In Psalm 110, verse 2, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. So Jesus Christ will hold the scepter because he has the right to rule, and he'll rule from Zion. And then you look at Isaiah 2, which we've looked at before. Verse 3, a prophecy of the coming kingdom. It says, many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, now look at the parallel line, and the word, so the law and the word are parallel, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, so the same location. So from that prophecy, all those prophecies until now, uh, Jerusalem's in trouble. There's a lot of turmoil over there, but we know it'll come true and God will work it out. Uh, Isaiah 59, 20, a redeemer will come to Zion. So the Messiah will one day, remember in Isaiah 63, he comes as a warrior covered in blood, and he is going to do fighting and bring Israel into the land. He'll come to Zion, and it says, and to those who turn from transgression and Jacob declares the Lord. So that's shuv. So when the Jews return to covenant loyalty after they turn or repent, of covenant disloyalty, the Lord's going to establish them in the land. Just like Deuteronomy 30 says, God says, when you return to me, I'll return to you. And most of you know what that means from our past studies. So the Jews will finally call on the name of the Lord. And I think at the end of the seven-year tribulation, the nation after coming to faith is then going to subsequently call on the Lord and he'll deliver them into the promised land. Joel 2.32, it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. I don't think this is salvation from the penalty of sin, and a gospel presentation is often used. I think it's dealing with something else. But notice, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now, we'll have you turn to this one. I love this chapter a great chapter of encouragement. It's really dealing with Israel, but since as Gentiles who believe in Jesus, we will enjoy the blessing as well when the kingdom's established. So turn to Zephaniah chapter 3, and we'll look at the prophecy of this prophet about the kingdom that's to come. We'll pick up in Zephaniah 3 verse 14. If you take more than five minutes, we're going to have to buy you tabs. Of course, if you've got a cell phone, I guess you just type it in, right? Or do cell phones have little paper tabs on the side? What was that picture of a cell phone I saw that had the rotary dial on it? You have to be pretty old to even know what the rotary dial Somebody said they had a rotary phone in their closet, and they pulled it out and gave it to a teenager. He goes, I don't know how to do that. I mean, how do you do that? Things have changed. <laughs> Probably for the better, because it took 10 minutes to dial 911 on one of those, right? <clears throat> Zephaniah 314, shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Dr. Allen prefers the translation daughter Zion. No genitive here, just daughter Zion. Like, like uh, the land is God's daughter. Uh, Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. So there's Zion and Jerusalem in parallel. Wow, a time of great joy and celebration. Are they doing that now? And they will. And we'll, we'll enjoy as well because Messiah will be ruling and we'll be with him. 
Verse 15, the Lord has taken away His judgments against you. That's Israel. He has cleared away your enemies. There, that has, See, if we're in the kingdom now, this, Israel would have no enemies, right? I mean, just you can watch the news and then use your Bible and go, we're clearly not in the millennial kingdom in any form. It says, the king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. I'm watching my time, but just a little aside. Have y'all ever heard? Yes, it's huge today, this whole kingdom discussion. Have you ever heard the phrase, the kingdom is in your heart? Where is that in the Bible? And most people will never be able to tell you. Now, in Luke 17, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in you, but the Greek can easily be translated in your midst. And by the way, who did he say that to? The Pharisees. So is the kingdom in their heart? No, they're the ones attacking him and wanting to kill him. They don't believe in him. So that's out of context. And the Greek can even mean in your midst, and so can the word of here in Hebrew. So because when Jesus walked the earth, the king is among them, therefore the kingdom is available. That's all he's saying, but they got to accept him. But I think the passage supporting this kingdom, the king is in your midst and the kingdom of God is in your midst, is here. Because when Jesus rules in the kingdom, what is he according to verse 15? He's in your midst because he's right there. He's ruling on David's throne physically. And now you don't have to fear disaster. So that's where I would go with uh, Jesus' statement there in the difficult passage of Luke 17 because There's more to that as far as difficulty. So notice prophecy. Now, the king was available. He was there in their midst in Luke 17. The kingdom was available. But since they rejected him, it requires a second advent to fulfill Zephaniah 3. So in verse 16, in that day it will be said to who? Jerusalem, which is the people of Jerusalem. Don't be, do not be afraid, O Zion. Don't let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is not in you, but in your midst. And then, do you have a victorious warrior? And you're, actually, in the Hebrew, it says a warrior who saves. I mean, he is a victorious warrior, but the Hebrew says he's a warrior who saves. Because in Isaiah 63, he comes from Basra, covered in blood. And, and Isaiah says, why is your apparel red? He goes, well, I've been treading in the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And I've, I'm covered in the blood of the enemy. But he says, it is I, mighty to save. So he's come back to deliver Israel into the land. So when Jesus comes back on the white horse in Revelation 19, uh, what's his robe dipped in? A robe dipped in blood. It's Isaiah 63. And he's treading the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. So finally it's being fulfilled. So finally after Jesus delivers Israel, this warrior who delivers or saves is in their midst. And what will he do? He'll exalt over you with joy. He'll be quiet in his love. And he'll rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Now, this just may be verbal speaking in a normal tone. Uh, Some have argued that he'll actually sing over his people Israel. Uh, Does Jesus enjoy music? I mean, isn't he the author of language and music? God is the one who gave it to us. So he could just speak it, but maybe he sings it. Wouldn't that be amazing? I want to hear this solo. But he's praising and exalting with joy because his people are now restored. He says, I'll gather those who grieve about the appointed feast, because remember Israel had those seven feasts on their calendar, and that had been so devastated and interrupted by their demise. They came uh, from you, O Zion, the reproach of the exile is a burden on them. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors, And I will save or deliver the lame and gather the outcast, and I'll turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. 
At that time, I'll bring you in. Even at that time, I'll gather you together. Ah, didn't Jesus say how I long to gather you together? As a mother hen wants to gather her chicks and put them under her wings, but you were unable. Well, they didn't accept it. And that was now that we wait a second advent. So he's indeed, I have given you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth, so even among the Gentile nations. When, future, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So when Israel finally gets their act together, are we going to trade up? We're going to enjoy, aren't we? Uh, but he's really focusing on this people. So Zechariah, you can turn to Zechariah 1 with me. Not Zephaniah, but Zechariah. <clears throat> so as you're going through this, you think, okay, Israel just keeps messing up and sinning against God. Is there any hope? Well, you see these prophecies, because the prophets have said God is going to spank you really hard. Still say, but there's going to be restoration in the future. So even in the time of the post-exilic community, it's not over. Even when they come back from Babylon, as bad as it looks, it's clear that God has maintained His zeal for Jerusalem. He's in covenant. He cannot break His word. So Zechariah 1.14, so the angel who was speaking with me said to me, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, and what does God say? I'm exceedingly jealous or zealous for Jerusalem and Zion. There's Jerusalem and Zion put together. I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease. For a while I was only a little angry. They furthered the disaster. Therefore, says the Lord, I'll return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it. What house is that? There will be a millennial temple, Ezekiel 40 through 48. And according to Zechariah chapter 6, it even says the Messiah will build that temple. Uh, some would say, well, he's going to be the chief foreman as he uses others to help. But the millennial temple will be built, so just read Ezekiel 40 and keep going to the end of the book declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Verse 17, and again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the cities will again overflow with prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. And then Zechariah 8, 3, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. The Jer Jerusalem will then be called the city of truth. The mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Now, Zechariah 9, this kind of works its way into Palm Sunday, doesn't it? So the prophecy before Jesus came in on the donkey on Palm Sunday, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and he is endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So when you read Matthew 21, Luke chapter 19, you'll see the triumphal entry. Jesus comes into the city on a donkey that was prepared. And they're laying down, it's Palm Sunday because they're laying down palm branches, right? And so they're waving them and then laying them down, uh, putting their coats out and and that's really Leviticus 23, because during the festival of booths, which is a kingdom festival, they took foliage of trees and palm branches and waved them. So are the Jews doing the right thing on the right day? Yes, that's the day. And they're thinking, kingdom's coming. No, <laughs> this is uh, what time of year? Passover, that wasn't the time. I'm going to die on Passover. I come back and celebrate the kingdom. So they, their theology is good, but it's just the wrong time. The nation had already rejected him. So we even remember that wonderful entry into the city today as we celebrate that and think about that. And then, of course, Jesus will be crucified on, I believe, Good Friday and raised on Sunday. Uh, so next Sunday, we're going to study and praise the Lord for the resurrection. Because apart from that, we don't have a chance, right? 1 Corinthians 15 says, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then you won't be raised either. You're still dead in your sins. 
So at the first advent, Jerusalem was the central location in Satan's temptation of Jesus. Remember one of the temptations? It said Satan led, led Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. Then he quotes Scripture, and what did Jesus say? Ah, it is written, you should not put the Lord your God to the test. But again, Jerusalem is central. And then when you get to um, what I found interesting about Luke years ago when I went through that book, the gospel will trace Christ's movements and constantly highlights Jerusalem as the place he's going to go and suffer. So when you get to Luke 9, Verse 51, verse 53, 13, 22, 33, 17, 11, 18, 31, 19, 11, 19, 28. It's highlighting that he's going to Jerusalem. That city is so focal because he's going to go there and suffer because what did even Jesus say in Matthew 20? Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. That doesn't necessarily mean north because when you go to Jerusalem, you go up upwards in elevation. So you might be coming from any direction going up. But we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that's Jesus, the Messiah, will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they'll condemn him to death, and they uh, will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify, and on the third day he'll raise. He'll be raised up, which is what we're going to celebrate next Sunday. So Pilate would order uh, Jesus crucified after the Roman soldiers you know, beat him and mock him, and all that came true but he rose from the dead, Matthew 28. Even in the seven woes to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, Jesus blames the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem for persecuting the prophets of God sent to them. Remember Matthew 23, 37, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Oh, how I often I wanted to gather your children together the way of Hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Behold, your house has left you desolate, is being left to you desolate. So, divine discipline, it's terrible. And the Romans are going to come in and destroy the temple in 40 years from that time. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Baruch Abba Bashem Yahweh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which was the Hebrew of Psalm 118. So he will come back, and you won't see me until you say that. So I think it's the Israelites calling on the Lord, and when they do, he'll return and rescue them. So before Jesus enters Jerusalem, before his crucifixion, he laments over the city. Luke 19, 41, again, he's on the donkey, um, Palm Sunday. He's approaching Jerusalem. He saw the city and wept over it. And he said, if you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace, Jerusalem. Now, so the city of peace is going to be turmoil. But from now on, they'll be hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Didn't that happen in the time after Solomon's temple was built? But who did it then? Remember, the Babylonians seized the city, built a wall around it, and eventually breached the city and destroyed the temple. And it's about to happen again. All because they wouldn't obey the Lord. So due to the rejection by the religious leaders... Of Israel, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. I think it's a prophecy of Rome coming in in 70 AD. So Luke 21, 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Oh, woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. Verse 24, and they'll fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So I think the times of the Gentiles started with uh, 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. And that goes all the way through history, through the tribulation until Jesus returns and removes the Gentile enemies from Israel. So real quick, I'll just summarize because I'm running out of time. Between His resurrection and ascension, so after Jesus raises from the dead and then returns to heaven, He tells the disciples that the message of the kingdom will go out starting in Jerusalem, which will be the actual location of the second coming. So in Acts 1, He gathered them together. He told them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which He said, You heard of me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. So the church begins on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes upon the, the Jews in Jerusalem. But then the goal of the church, the goal of all of us in the church, uh, the body of Christ with local churches participating, is to take the gospel out. We're not to sit around and wait for them to come to us. So we send out missionaries. And, um, but you can do missionary work too, right? You can evangelize. You can just give the gospel to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but the mission of the church is to give the gospel to people and then uh, make disciples, uh, and they can, they can learn about Jesus, and then they can go do the same thing. Um, so they're to take out the message, and it would start in Jerusalem. So God's not done with the city. So at the second advent... Because because Jesus will leave this earth, they watch him go up into the sky, and the two men dressed in white, I think those are angels, they said he's going to return the same way. So a second advent's required, and he'll come back to this earth and rule in Zion. Um, Jerusalem is going to be the place of his return in glory, the prophecy of Zechariah 14.4. And that day, that's future, hasn't happened yet. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I mean, he's done that once, but he'll come back to do it again. Which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley. Did that happen at his first advent? No, but it'll happen then. So that half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. So maybe a little... A few geographical changes are in order in the future. And then even the nations are going to go to Jerusalem to worship King Jesus because there will be those among the Gentiles who believed. Not all did. Zechariah 14, 16, it will come about that any who are left of the nations that went against Jerusalem, so some of those among the nations did not participate. They did believe. They will go to Jerusalem year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. I got some questions about, it's a Jewish festival, but even the Gentiles are going to participate. I, I just have questions on exactly what that's going to look like, but it's going to happen. <clears throat> Maybe if we're part of that, y'all can turn to me and go, well, there it is, David, right there. Sometimes for me, uh, I may not have enough time to work through all the things in the Bible to understand it. Uh, hindsight may be twenty twenty on some stuff. <clears throat> Too bad we can't live to be 500 like pre-flood times, right? You could really get smart in the Bible. I don't know. Would you want to live to be 500? I'm celebrating my 460th birthday today. So Jesus will then rule the kingdom of God from the Davidic throne in Jerusalem. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, he'll rule on David's throne. Jeremiah 3, 17. Hold on. At that time, they'll call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord, and they will, uh, nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of their evil heart. So, Kind of backing up before that all happens. Remember when the kingdom is established, the millennium, Revelation 20, Satan is bound for a thousand years by the angel with the great chain in his hand. It's, he, the abyss is sealed over him. He can't get out. But at the end of the millennium, Satan's released. And what does he do? 
He's a good angel now, right? No, he leads a rebellion against the Lord. I guess prison didn't rehab him. So he comes out and he goes against Israel. Uh, but verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Revelation 20, verse 7, Satan will be released from his prison, will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came upon a broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So that's from the Lord. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are also, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So no more release after this. Uh, Satan, all the fallen angels are in the lake of fire. Uh, the beast and the false prophet, so the Antichrist and the false prophet of Revelation 13 are put there. And according to Matthew 25, 41, all unbelievers will be there as well throughout anyone who rejected Christ throughout human history. So as we close, Jerusalem is a major city throughout biblical history. The eternal state following the millennial kingdom will have a new Jerusalem. Revelation 3.10 or 3.12. Remember this text. It's been a while. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he'll not go out from it anymore. And I'll write on him a name, the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So again, our passage basically says the same thing. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Um, there's a discussion about the new Jerusalem, this holy city, and I, I'm not dogmatic on my view on this, but I'll, I'll just let you know what some of the views are. Some think this city exists now. Uh, it's waiting for the descent uh, which will happen when the old heavens and earth are completely destroyed. They'll, they'll uh, use Galatians 4, 26, Hebrews 12, 22 to try to support that. Some even think the city will be suspended over the earth during the millennium and the church will go back and forth from the holy city to the earth and then it will eventually come down to earth and that won't happen anymore. Um, Dr. Andy Woods holds that. Others do. Um, I had some quote. I think when Greg grabs the slides, there's um, a couple of quotes by Dr. Pentecost and then Charles Ryrie at the end. I'm out of time, but so some hold that as well. Um, but I know a new heavens and a new earth is coming and a new Jerusalem's coming. And our destiny is this incredible place we're headed for. Now, you may have had a tough week and think, is there anything good in this life? Give me some good news. Is that good news? This is where we're, I mean, imagine being in the worst prison on the planet and somebody comes in with a brochure and says, here's where you're going really soon. You open it up and it's the most beautiful, like a Hawaii or I don't know, wherever the most beautiful place on the planet is for you. You're like, I'm going there? Yes. When? Very soon. Would that give you any encouragement? Now you'd pin that on the wall going, that's where I'm heading. Why aren't we pinning this on the wall of our hearts, these texts going, look, the world's going to, Jesus said in this world you have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. It's not going away until he says it is, and we have to deal with it and minister in this dark world. That's why he leaves us here. Um, so one day, this is where we're going to be. And again, like the lady who didn't even know what the purpose of the land of Israel was and why all the fighting's going on, had no biblical frame of reference, how many even know of these wonderful promises that would really help them uh, when they get depressed and down in the mouth? We all need that. None of us are immune to that. And so we need the encouragement of the Holy Scriptures as we read them and the Holy Spirit reveals them to us. So, as I always say at the end of these sermons in this context, well, probably almost every sermon anyway, um, if you want to be a part of this eternal state of no more tears, no more pain, no more death, 
then you have to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The alternative is that you don't, some people, well, if I just cease to exist, who cares? But you will exist somewhere forever, either with the Lord or in eternal judgment. So if you want to take a free gift and be saved from eternal judgment, then God has an offer for you. So two things. God had to provide something to make it possible. So in 1 Peter 2.24, God sent His Son, and we know that He, Jesus Himself, bore our sins in His own body on the cross, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness, for by His wound we were healed. So He goes to the cross, He bears the sins of all humanity, past, present, and future, in His own body on the cross. So if you wonder if you have a chance, well, you've been paid for. He's already paid for your sin as your substitute. Then he raises from the dead. But there is a requirement for the unbeliever to receive the benefits. He has to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. But in 3.18, he says, he who believes in Jesus is not condemned, but he who does not believe in Jesus stands condemned already. So you better believe or you'll remain in condemnation, and then that will lead you to the great white throne judgment where you'll be sentenced forever into the lake of fire. And why was he sentenced? Because he says he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God, John 3.18. <clears throat> I can't make the decision for you, any more than anyone made it for me when I was 26. So either believe it and receive eternal life or reject it. If you've already received eternal life through faith in Christ, then go share it with someone else. Do you think there's anyone in Houston that needs the gospel? Uh, they're all over the world. Um, uh, people need to hear the good news. And they need to hear it biblically, not this, well, you need to join a church or you'll go to hell. Oh, and you've got to give money too or you'll go to hell. There was a guy that was not allowed to join a church because they checked his finances and says, you're not able to give. You can't even become a member here. The world hears this. What, what unbeliever wants to be a part of that? So the way we live and the way we represent God and uh, share His grace and so forth will really impact people. And um, So when I came to faith, I finally heard the Jesus of the Bible and the good news from Scripture. And went, that isn't how it was presented to me. If I'm going to heaven, they're always telling me, well, you have to join a church. So I have to become, become a, a church member of some denomination? Well, I mean, I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, but any, any unbeliever can figure out that that's nonsense. And, uh, but then I heard the gospel of the cross, and I'm like, well, I know. I'm, by the time I was 26, I had it pretty well figured out I was a sinner. <laughs> Maybe for you, hey, probably a lot younger for me than that, but I had no problems with understanding that. So I took the free gift. I mean, when I saw this, I'm like, well, that's what I've been missing. And then once you get saved, he goes, now I have a whole plan for you that I want you to be a part of and I want you to follow to my glory. So next week, I'm sorry, we're going to have to take a break from Revelation, but hey, we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and then we'll return to Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4, uh, the following week. So let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. We all thank you for another day. It's another day to serve you, and we just pray for those opportunities to come up. Just as you guide us on our path, may we be ever aware of those who uh, might need to hear the gospel or just fellow Christians that we might meet that just need an encouraging word. And maybe they can encourage us. Because, Lord, the, just being in that hospital all those months and all the encouraging news I got to give people, the nurses and sometimes the doctors, they would come in with incredible encouragement in the Lord. It went both ways. And the body of Christ was working together in all situations. And so may those we meet encourage us and keep us uh, walking with you strongly. Because sometimes we just see believers come into Christ and then their zeal for the Lord and it puts a stride in our step and reminds us of how important it is to walk with you and have that same love for you. And may we be not like 
one of the seven churches that had forsaken their first love, the Lord Jesus Christ, and just quit walking with Him and enjoying His presence and fellowship. So, Lord, this is, this is about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. So keep us developing that relationship with Him spiritually and as a body of believers here at this local church. So, Lord, we thank You for our time this morning, and we just uh, praise You that Jesus will come back for us as one raised from the dead, as we'll see next week in our celebration of uh, Resurrection Day. And He will come back to resurrect us and bring us to glory. We praise you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 118. His name is Wonderful.